We will be in John chapter 6 again today. Love that last song we just did. The Bible says that the spirit of truth lives inside each and every believer and that he will lead us into all truth. So let's claim that as at least one of the reasons for singing that song this morning. Holy Spirit, you are indeed welcome here. Father, we come before you this morning just asking for the fullness of the blessing that you have for us today, whatever that means. Lord, we ask you to rise up and let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. Protect us from any and all distractions this morning that would keep us from the message that you want each and every one of us to hear. Lord, speak through me this morning to me and to everybody else. Lift us up as only you can. Equip us as only you can so that you can send us as only you can. So in Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. amen. A little bit of background for a couple of folks that, that haven't been around. Jesus is speaking to the bread and fish crowd. These are the uh, folks who, who met them and got teaching all day. And then Jesus performs the miracle of the fishes and the loaves and takes a little bit and makes it a lot. And now he can't get rid of them. They're just following him everywhere he goes. Now they're wanting more fish and bread. So that prompts the uh, following discourse here. If we look at verse 27 in chapter 6 here's what we see Jesus speaking to this crowd he says do not labor for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the son of man will give you because God the father has set his seal on him and that that leads us to this verse 28 then they said to him what shall we do that we may work the works of God but they didn't get the answer they were looking for they were looking for a to-do list and here's what they get from Jesus Jesus answered and said to them this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. In the original language, that word believe, it, it means entrust. It means have faith in something or someone. It has a very specific meaning. It's not that just that, that you believe that, that something happened or that something is true or that somebody else's testimony about something is legitimate. It's actually putting your eggs in that basket. It's actually putting yourself in the position of having to trust in that, in trust. That's the belief that Jesus is looking for here. It's what God has always been looking for from his people. This has always been the thing God has wanted from his people. We learn from the story of Abraham that real faith, active faith, the faith that just does what God says, regardless of feelings, emotions, other advice, regardless of anything else, real faith does what God says to do and in the story of Abraham we saw that we saw him take the son he had waited for for so long the promised son and God said I want you to take that son and I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice on the altar and Abraham did out of faith he trusted God see God had already told him this is the son and I'm going to multiply you. You're going to be, uh, your descendants are going to be so many. It's like the sand on the, on, the, on the ocean, beaches around the world. You're not going to be able to count your descendants. And so he, he had to remember that God said that. And so when God said, now I want you to sacrifice your son, his faith said, I don't get it, but this is going to work out. On the way there, his, his son, poor, poor little Isaac, right? He's like, hey, Dad, I see we got the, uh, the wood for, for the fire and, and we got the stuff. We, we got all the stuff that we, we, don't, we don't have to sacrifice, Dad. What did Abraham say? God will provide the sacrifice. It's the gospel, again, all the way back there in that story. And real faith allowed him to move where he didn't want to go, where he couldn't fathom having to go. And we have no indication that he wasn't going to follow through with what God had commanded him. He places his son on the altar. He's ready to kill him. And God says, wait, now I know you have faith in me above all else. And it said that he accounted that to Abraham as righteousness. See, we're all looking for righteousness, right? Righteousness is what we need to spend forever with God instead of forever in condemnation. Heaven instead of hell. It's righteousness. That's the only ticket that will get you there. And we, knowing ourselves, know that's an iffy prospect. <laughs> but if faith can be accounted as righteousness, oh, now, see, now we got something. See, that's something we can do. We can choose to believe. It's not always going to be easy. 
you're, you're certainly going to get pushback from your own flesh and from everybody else you encounter, but you can do that. You can choose to believe that God is not a liar. You can choose to believe that God has your best interests at heart. You can choose to believe that he will provide the sacrifice. And by faith, you can walk in that belief. See, faith has always been the problem. It was a lack of faith in God that led to the first sin in the garden. Because God had said, hey, you can have anything else, but the, the fruit from that tree, I don't, want, don't eat that. Because as soon as you do, you're going to die. And what did the enemy do? He said, is that what he said? Did he say that? You will not surely die. See, at that point, Adam and Eve both had a choice to make. Who are we going to believe? Where are we going to put our faith? And the God who created us are in this slick tongue devil here trying to offer something God said wasn't for us. You know how that story turned out. Faith has always been the issue. It was lack of faith there, and that led to all the problems we have now. And so it makes sense that God would choose to allow the presence of faith to overcome the curse of the spiritual death that came from the lack of faith. In the beginning, see, it all makes sense in a perfect way that we never would have thought of. And that's what Jesus wants these guys to understand. So he tells them and us that the way to do what God would have us do is to trust him, to allow him to define things, to allow him to set things in order in our lives, to allow him to be the Lord of our lives in every possible way. That's what real faith looks like. Amazingly, our friends in the, in the crowd here in the passage, they see what Jesus has said as a radical departure from everything they think they know about worship and discipleship. Everything they know about religion comes from work. Do, 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 do. Get. That's what they've been taught. So since this probably seems to them like it's too good to be true, kind of like the one guy I shared the gospel with one time, and he said, it can't be that simple. I think they're having the same misgivings here. Seems way too good to be true, as, as the understood grace of God usually is. It's hard to take it in. It's hard to accept. It seems too simple. It seems too easy, really. Now, anybody who's a real believer will tell you, well, the walk is not easy. But salvation is extremely easy, extremely simple, extremely accessible. They're not there yet. So they want some proof that he has the authority to change the system because they think he's changing the system. So verse 30, therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. These guys always seem to work things back around to lunch, don't they? It's like American Christians. It's like, we've got to get out of here and get to lunch. Enough of the bread and fish stories. We need some bread and some fish. What they're actually saying is this. Hey, Moses provided us bread, so our people followed him. What are you offering so that we'll follow you? You ever come at God that way? Lord, if you will just fix this problem, I will follow you forever if you will just get that girl to like me that guy to like me i will serve you negotiations bad way to approach god honestly though for them that's how it usually worked right as we read the old testament we see the people were usually fine with moses so long as they had what they wanted but as soon as they were a little bit hungry or a little bit thirsty, what did they do? They turned on him. As though his only worth, his only reason for being was to make sure they had what they needed. And in a way, that's exactly the role he was fulfilling, just not in the way they understood it. They thought he was, his only worth was as the provider of their material sustenance, food, Water, shelter, direction. Never mind all the other things he did for them. Confronting Pharaoh for them. Leading them away from slavery. Intervening with God on their behalf to keep them from being wiped out on several occasions. 
shouldering the burden of leading a group this size, being a judge and jury for all their civil disputes. It's quite a role he was fulfilling. I didn't appreciate any of that. It's like, yeah, do all that, but make sure we got plenty to eat. Make sure we don't get thirsty, because then we just don't have any use for you. They were like little babies, crying every time they felt hungry or thirsty until their needs were met to their satisfaction. Now, ironically, in the promised land, eventually there was a time of peace when they were able to relax and, and kind of recuperate and kind of enjoy the land that God had just given them through all these series of, of hard-fought battles. But it was in those very times when they were at peace and had everything they wanted that they tended to do what? They got content and lazy and sloppy. That's when they strayed away from God. That's when they rejected the messages he was sending through various prophets and judges. That's what led them to not do the work of God, which is believe in the one whom he sent. Lesson for us? Don't despise your needs and your troubles. If you have no needs that need to be met, then you have no need to come to the one that offers the supply of the needs. If you have everything you want, you don't really have a reason to talk to God. You don't really have a reason to come to him and ask to stay close, to lean in, to depend on him, to listen to his every word. It's in the need. That's where we find that pull to him. And he wired us that way. It's no accident. It's the way he designed it for our benefit. Listen, too much peace is not a good thing. Too much contentment is not a good thing. It's not, we're not designed to handle it very well. God has built into us a need for him. And when we don't, we stray, just like we see over and over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament. Don't despise your needs. Sometimes that's the way he's keeping you tethered to him, which is a good thing. That's a sermon for another day. Verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who, who, who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Here's their problem, the real problem, and it's systematic. They've been taught to be Abraham's children and Moses' disciples, not God's. That's what the flesh does. The flesh gravitates toward the literal last uh, person who was in contact with the thing that you needed. Not necessarily the source of it, but the person that handed it to you. And they have thousands of years of this cycle of needing and God providing. But because of the way he has chosen to do it, he's usually doing that through a prophet, through a messenger, through a judge, through a king, through a, an earthly intermediary. Symbolic, all of Jesus to come. That's why he did it that way. Somewhere along the lines, the leaders, the teachers, the rulers lost the heart of the scripture. And they settled in on the literalness of what they could see, what they could touch, what they could taste, what they could feel. And they taught that to the people and now the people believe wholeheartedly in Abraham and wholeheartedly in Moses I'm not sure they think about God very much that's a problem certainly God appoints and equips leaders and messengers and teachers and they can be very valuable to us but they come and go they must come and go Whatever blessing I receive from those who lead and teach me and whatever blessing you may receive as I try to do the same for you, 
is a blessing from God, not from any man. James chapter 1, he tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. He loves all of his kids and he blesses all of his kids through human vessels. God is the provider. God is the healer. God is the counselor. God is everything else you could possibly need. He's the great I am. <laughs> While every person through whom he sends those things is just a conduit. Bless themselves for being allowed to be a part of what he's doing. Don't ever worship the conduit. The Israelites have learned to worship Abraham and Moses instead of God. They're thankful for the garden hose instead of the water. And the American church has that problem in a big way. Turning pastors and teachers into celebrities. And pastors and teachers are just men. You treat them that way, their flesh jumps up and says, yeah, I am kind of cool, ain't I? I mean, I would never say that. <laughs> Which is pretty cool, right? <laughs> the Israelites were thankful for the hose pipe, not only instead of the water, but instead of the creator of the water who sent it to them. We need to remember what they forgot. What did God say to, to Joshua after Moses passed on? Moses, my servant, is dead. But this story isn't over. Yes, I used Moses. Moses was my servant. Blessed and highly favored. My servant. He served me well. He served you well. Joshua, as your leader, teaching you how to lead, he served you well. But he's dead. And you still got to carry on. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Don't ever tie your forward uh, uh, momentum to another person. Because if they die, you might as well. It's okay to acknowledge someone as the one God has used to bless you. That's not a problem. But only he gets the credit for the blessing itself. Actually, the time Moses sinned and got sideways with God is very interesting to me to look into on this specific topic. Go over to Numbers for a second. Numbers chapter 20. You remember this? You know, there was a time when, when they were thirsty, there wasn't any water, and God used that to share what we now understand as the beginning of the gospel story when he says to Moses, I want you to go and strike this rock, and water will come from it and feed all the people. That was the first time. Now it happens again, and the people are thirsty, and they come to Moses, and he goes to God, and God says, we'll pick up the story here, Numbers 20, Verse 1, then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zen in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation. So they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, because that's what they do. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from their presence, from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. 
So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came out abundantly. And the congregation and their animals drank. But that's when Moses lost his chance to go into the promised land. Because he sinned. What was his sin? What's the problem? Two things. He didn't follow instructions. He messed with the message. He didn't know there was a bigger message going on here. The message was the first time you strike the rock. The next time you can just speak to the rock. Because Jesus gets struck. But after that all we have to do is speak to him. That's the message. So he didn't follow instructions which mess with the message and he tried to include himself in the credits. Do we have to bring you water from this rock? I kind of wish God had just went. Do it, big boy. We'll see what you got. Whack, whack, whack. I'll be with you in a minute. Whack, whack. There'd have been some speaking to the rock then. Please, rock, please, please. Now, to further tie this event into today's message, what about the next verse? Numbers 20, verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me. Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. The story is going to continue. I'm still giving them the land, but because you didn't believe in me. Well, Moses believes in God, right? Yeah. But believe is in trust. Put all your faith in. When we do that with God, it shows itself as us following his instructions very carefully, very purposefully. You know, there's an admonition in Scripture um, against sinning when you're angry. In your anger, don't sin. There's a, a, I think, a a lesson there in that, hey, you're going to be angry sometimes. There is such a thing as righteous anger. But be careful because that is a gateway, a doorway to self-centeredness and sin you can have righteous anger against someone and choose to go to God with it instead of them and it's way less likely you're going to sin Moses had righteous anger against these people they were jerks sometimes right why did you bring us out of slavery why would you do that Moses Over and over and over again, through Moses, God blesses them. And yet every time they're, they're a little hang, hungry or a little, I said hangry. I started to say hangry. That's a word now, isn't it? It is. Every time they were a little hungry or a little thirsty, they turned on Moses. And finally, he's fed up with it. Do we have to bring water for you from this rock again? Will you believe this time? angry and he got self-centered for a second and he didn't do what God said and then he tried to take credit for what God was doing and he didn't get to go into the promised land it cost him dearly that is a lack of faith faith in God says whether I understand what he told me to do or not whether I like what he told me to do or not whether I want to do what he told me to do or not He's God. So I do that. I do that. Period. We talked last week about just settling things. When you know God said to do something, just do it. Period. So there's a big problem with the people in today's passage because they have misguided loyalty. 
They're loyal to Abraham and Moses. They don't really seem to know God, honestly. Which makes them come at Jesus with a completely wrong context for taking in what he's trying to teach them. They're putting what he's saying through their filter, through their lens, and the message is getting twisted. They're saying, we know what Moses could do. Now what will you do to prove that we should follow you instead? But even if that is their mindset, why in the world would they not already be convinced that he's worth following? What would it take? Does he really have anything left to prove? Does he really need to do anything else to earn their trust? He's shown amazing power to perform miracles. Did everybody see all of them? No, but word spread. That's where the crowds came from. They've all heard about the water being turned into wine. They've all heard about people getting healed, people almost dying but being healed. They've heard of demons being cast out. They've heard that he empowered his servants to go out and heal people and cast out demons. They, they ate the bread and the fish that he created. What else does he need to do? What about this? Not only is he that powerful, he's showing that he has powers of creation and powers over the dark side of the spiritual world. He's proving that he has dominion over everything that we interact with on a daily basis. And with all of that power, look how he's using it. What would you do if you had that kind of power? Don't say it out loud. Because I'm going to call you a liar because you wouldn't be honest. Look, they're, they're missing the whole point. This guy has all of this power and all he's doing is trying to bless us. All he's doing is being nice to us. He just he sits and teaches. He talks to us all day long. When we're hungry, he feeds us. When somebody's sick, he heals them. He never calls down lightning and to kill us. He never dominates us with that power. What does he have to do? Do they really need more proof? Do we? We established back in chapter 1 of John that he is God. That he created everything from nothing. He's proven who he is by the miracles we know about and accept as true. Hey, most of us even accept that, that he has the power and the authority and the desire to forgive us of our sins so that we won't be condemned to hell. We believe that. We're latched on to that. But there are still instances where we reject what he counsels us to do because we think we have a better idea of what would be best for us. What does he have to do? To get us to believe. To entrust. have faith in him it's lunacy once a person has accepted the gospel that salvation comes through faith in him alone what's left to doubt about anything he asks us to have faith in? it doesn't make any sense what rationalization is there for not doing the works of god which according to jesus is to believe to have faith to entrust and him who the Father has sent. Perhaps some of us should think this one through a bit this week. Make sure that your direction makes sense. Make sure that you're walking by faith and not by sight. Make sure you are searching to find out what he has said and then asking his ability to be given to you to just do that. And even if he says, I want you to take your son and offer him up as a sacrifice, and you know God said it, then you just proceed. Assuming that even though you don't have a clue how this could possibly end well, it will. One way or another. Jesus continues with his explanation of the true importance of the, of the coming of their long-awaited Messiah. See, that's the thing. They've been waiting for him all this time. And now that he's here, and they're like, eh, not really what we were looking for. Next, verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. 
Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. They use the word Lord in the original. That's kuros, authority. Master, they're ascribing authority to him here. Lord, tell us what to do so that we can have bread always. The planted seed is trying to grow. It's trying. 35, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you, you have seen me, and yet do not believe. How sad. It's the Achilles heel of human history. Seeing. Even interacting with the one true God without believing, without entrusting, having faith in him completely. Satan, Adam and Eve, everyone besides Noah and his family, Pharaoh, the Israelites by the Jordan the first time, the Israelites who actually crossed the Jordan. After a time, all but 130 or so of the people who walked the earth with Jesus and listened to his teachings and were in his presence. All but about 130 of them saw but did not believe. And now our nation today. All with the same issue. Seeing, even interacting. Wanting the blessing that comes from being attached to him in some way without wanting any of the responsibility of, of following him, of showing that you actually believe in him. Now, I get that, that a lot of people are wrestling with the flesh, which never wants to accept terms of submission. They, they, the flesh never wants to utter the word Lord to anybody other than itself. And many are blinded by the God of this age. They're not yet in a position to see the truth. They can't see it yet. It's not the right time. I understand all of that. What boggles my mind is this, and I just can't get away from it. Why do so many of us who fully believe that Jesus came and lived and died and rose again still struggle to believe that he can do everything else he says he can do? How can we fully believe that the Jesus we believe came and lived and died and rose again? Why can't we believe everything he says we should believe? Why can't we have that kind of faith? He is Lord of all or not Lord at all. We use that phrase all the time. He can do everything he says or he can't be trusted to do anything he says. He's God, or he isn't. Settle it. Choose today whom you will serve. If God, let it be God. If some other thing, created thing, hey, serve that. But quit mixing the two. You can't serve God and yourself at the same time. Here's the great thing about knowing that he is the one who can be trusted. Verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. How glorious. This mighty God with all of that power, the power to destroy his creation with a flood, has decided to take that power and use it for our benefit. To save us instead of destroy us and start over and try again. And 
And this is the will of him who sent me. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. The plea, the invitation from Jesus, think bigger. Get your eye off of self. Choose my version of love, God would say. Choose my version of belief. Jesus does say, and if you do, I will raise you up on the last day. What's the last day? I don't know. It's the day that you die. It's the day that that Jesus comes back. It's the day of the rapture. I don't know when. I don't care when. The important thing is he will raise you up that day and if that's not enough for him to have our undivided attention our undivided loyalty our absolute faith then what would it take think bigger Pass the food and the water and the rent and the health for the present. I know those are things you have to deal with. Yeah. Deal with them. Bring those to God. Ask Him for that help. You will get it. But think past that and to eternity in the presence of the God who provides those things. Think bigger. Past religion to relationship. Past the hard work of the law and being good and doing better and trying to earn something from God, working hard day after day after day. Turn from that. Look past it. Think bigger. Take grace instead. What is there about work in verse 40? Does it say, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who works hard enough and makes themselves better and helps themselves and pulls themselves up by their bootstraps may have everlasting life? No. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. Not of works. At all. Think bigger. Past the God in the cloud who speaks with thunder that shakes the mountains and to the still, small voice right where you are. God in the flesh. God inside you if you're a believer. A believer, one who puts their faith in, who entrusts Jesus. See, we're starting to run into a problem using the term believer. Because if you, if you were to do one of those studies in America and ask how many believers in Jesus there are, the numbers would be astronomical. But Jesus himself says, narrow is the gate. There are few who find it. The larger the group gets, the more of those people are using the wide gate. And their sense of belief is that of Pharaoh. Pharaoh came to a point where he knew God was real. He knew God had authority over him and his circumstances. But he still didn't turn from his will. He still didn't turn from what he wanted to do. He still didn't turn from his plan for his life. Even when faced with ruin. And he gave up for a few hours. Long enough for the Israelites to walk out of town with his riches and his people's riches. But by the time they got to the sea, he was in hot pursuit again. He couldn't stand it. He would not bow to God. He would not lose to God. But he did. And everybody who has that attitude will. Whether it manifests itself like that, brazen, bold out in the in front everybody knows it or whether it's just pretending to be something you're not 
and still living your life the way you want to live it, not having surrendered yourself to Jesus. See, that's the belief he's looking for. And trust. That's what he's looking for. And that's hard. Not because it's a difficult thing to do. It's, man, our flesh is just so strong and it's had what it wanted for so long and it doesn't want to give that up for anything. And the enemy's right there whispering and, and maybe, I don't know what he can do. Maybe he can create some circumstances that make things easier to do the wrong thing. I don't know. But I know he can't make us do anything. He can't make me do anything. He can only tempt and the flesh can only want but the word says, reckon your flesh dead. Just treat it as though it died. Don't allow it to speak to you and lead you to the place you don't want to go, where you should not be, because God has said otherwise. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What's your response to that? What's theirs? 41. The Jews then complained about him. Because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? See, as soon as it got to, Jesus, you're cool, and you got some power and all that. And hey, we're ready to get on board. If you could just come to some terms here with us, you know, what are you going to provide? But you're kind of weird. We're going to need something back to follow you. And when he wasn't willing to negotiate, he's still harping on this belief in me thing, belief in the one who sent me thing. They're like, wait a minute, wait, wait. What are we talking about? This is Jesus. We know him. We watched him grow up. That's Joseph's boy, right? Americans are way too good at whatever. Yeah. Don't let your reaction be theirs. It said they complained about him. It means they murmured and they muttered and they grumbled. You ever do that to God? Anybody want to share? <laughs> I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. We're going to end with a, with a song today. Too. But please don't lose sight of this. Please, please don't, don't walk away from here uh, unwilling to Look into your own mirror and judge yourself appropriately. Not the condemnation. I don't want you to condemn yourself any more than I want anybody else to condemn you. But I want you to take the advice of Jesus when he said, consider your way. Do you really believe me? Are you really following me? Because that's how you believe. That's how, you, that's how believe, belief manifests itself under this definition. Are you willing to give up what I ask you to give up? Are you willing to turn from what your flesh wants and what the world wants you to have and what the world tells you is success? Will you trade that for what I have for you? Because that's what faith looks like. And that's what I want for us. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. I don't always do this right either. Always with a microphone. <laughs> Believe. Believe. Make a choice. Do it on purpose. If you're going to do it wrong, do it on purpose. Just don't pretend. Amen? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this point blank presentation from jesus about what it means to follow you to believe in you to do the works of god you have made it so simple that we can't misunderstand it unless we want to so god by the power of your spirit i pray that that you would stir in us a desire to not want to 
Lord, I don't want to argue with you anymore. I don't want to complain about your provision anymore. I don't want to seek my own goals anymore. I, I don't want to do it my way anymore. I saw what happened when I did that. It was awful. I just want you. I just want your way. There's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in destruction. Lord, I don't want that. So I'm going to choose today to do it your way, on purpose. And I'm going to struggle like a baby trying to learn how to walk. I'm going to struggle. I'm going to need you to reach out and grab me and help stabilize me when I, when I start to fall. And when I do fall and I'm crying, I need you to wrap your arms around me and lift me up. Encourage me to try again. Because the world is going to tell me everything but that. And my flesh is going to tell me everything but that. And the enemy, he's not going to stop talking about everything but that. I need a revelation. I need you and your will to be revealed to me in a way that I can understand, in a way that I can follow. Give us the strength to choose you, Lord, over everything else. It's in Jesus' name. And God's people said.